batteries. All right, Calvin, if you can switch over to my iPad, please. And I just want to check it to make sure that it can be seen because it is going to be crucial tonight. Yep, we got it. Calvin, I'm going to rotate and see what it does. All right, that's about as good as I'm going to get it, I think, on this thing. All right, Calvin, we live? Uh, Sir? Great. You recording too? Thank you. You recording, right? Great. So tonight we start one chapter of the Bible, and we will be on this one chapter for I don't know exactly how long. Uh, I know at minimum we're going to be here three nights. Uh, that is at minimum. Uh, I, what I have learned, I cannot wait to share, and I cannot wait to hear as you begin to learn it what you speak back because it is that um, life-changing. It is one of those moments where you begin to look at something that you've known for so long, and you begin to ask yourself, why did I not know this until now? Kelly, can you grab that door? And so... Um, what I'm asking that you do tonight is not suspend what you have learned your entire Christian life, but to give your mind room enough not to have what you have learned for so long block what you are about to learn. Does that make sense? And I hope that you will trust me enough to give me the leeway enough to speak and let me get enough down the path that you don't shut me off in the process, okay? Because there's going to be some things tonight in particular, but then the next night that we meet, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, I, I, how did it get to there? And why are we learning this now? And so just bear with me as we go through this. Uh, this is the first time I've taught it at this level, and it's the first time I've ever studied John chapter 3 to this level. And I wish somebody that whenever I was six years old and I first came to know Jesus, that somebody would have discipled me at some point through this scripture in this way as an adult. Because I believe what you're going to find is that once we go through this with one another, you're going to be able to articulate what Jesus means to you in such a way that you've never been able to articulate it to anyone before because you're going to realize things about who he is and what he's done that will take all the Christian ease out of it and you'll just be able to say it in the language that your heart speaks and you'll be able to say it in a way that you'll go I didn't know that was in me and I didn't know that it was that easy to tell people about what Jesus has done and so tonight is we may get through lesson one tonight Kelly was like y'all saw me earlier scrolling and it was like oh my goodness I think I might have put too much in if we don't finish lesson one tonight I will go back and clip it and make sure we get to it there is so much background work tonight I don't want you to get um, frustrated I don't want you to be like come on Chad get there get there I'm setting you up for the punch and so you've got to get a lot of data crammed in your nugget so that whenever the punch lands, it's just going to be like a huge light bulb all of a sudden. And you're going to be like, oh my gosh, no wonder he did X, Y, and Z. I now understand why he was doing all that. But it's going to take us a little while, okay? So don't be like, hey, Chad, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You can get there quicker. Just give me time. We'll get there. Okay. So tonight, um, if you're online and you're looking, what I'd like to make sure you see is that there's actually a PDF. And, and Calvin, I need you to start pushing the screen up here so people can see it. I need people to be able to see it on the screen. And so there's a PDF that I actually put up. And that PDF, Calvin, I need it to be all the screen, not me. Okay? Because you can't see it the way I've got it flipped. There you go, bud. Thank you. Um, this PDF file, if you go here, you can actually download it. Everybody tonight is going to get a copy of this file, okay? This is out of the Lexham English Bible, and it has not been retranslated by me or Tim Mackey or anybody like that. This is straight out of the Lexham English Bible, but I've constructed it in such a way that it does lay out differently. It's the same verse order, 
but you'll see that it's going to be laid out a little bit different. If you're online, please go ahead and click on this file, download this PDF file, and print it. Okay? I don't care if you print it on two pages or front and back, but here in the class, what we've done is we've printed it on front and back. We are not going to touch that till the end almost. So um, tonight, we're going to focus in on John chapter 3, but to focus in, we've got to understand who we're talking about, where they are, what time period in history they're in, and what we're dealing with from a cultural standpoint. Because if we miss that, we miss the whole meaning behind John chapter 3. We have taken John chapter 3 typically as a people group. And we've looked at John chapter 3 and said, oh, it's John chapter 316. We paint it under our football cheeks and we, you know, do that kind of thing. And we can quote it verse by verse, you know, word by word. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to deconstruct the history around it because when we deconstruct the history, it'll make more sense, okay? So let's start this journey on a simple reading of the text. We're just going to simply read the text by itself. Calvin, if you can clip me in to this side and cover up this side right here, great. If you can't, it's no big deal. Um, I just want to make sure the screen, what's most important is the text, not my ugly mug. Um, John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. We're just going to read it straight through, okay? We're not going to pause for any significance. This man came to him, Jesus, at night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one is able to perform these signs that you are performing unless God were with him. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born from above, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is an old man? He is not able to enter his mother's womb for a second time and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and spirit, he is not able to enter into the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit, the capital spirit, is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, it is necessary for you to be born from above, Nicodemus. The wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, capital Spirit. Nicodemus answered, it's so hard for me not to interrupt and say, let me show you this. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher of Israel? And you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify about what you testify about what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I tell you earthly things, Nicodemus, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, thus it is necessary that the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this way God loved the world, so that he gave his one and only Son, in order that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he should judge the world, but in order that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged, but the one who does not believe has already been judged, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light in order that his deeds may be revealed and they are done in God. Okay, we're going to stop there because next week we'll get in the next verses. So what I want you to do first is when you scroll down, what you'll notice is, is that you'll see the key characters that we're going to study tonight. And we have to study who they are so that we can fully understand. What do you need, Calvin? That's okay. Just let it go. So the first key character that we're going to study is we're going to look at the Jewish population. We're going to look at the Pharisees in specific and Nicodemus. And then we're going to look at Jesus, God, the Spirit, Moses, the world, Israel, and the Son of Man. So let's start with the Jewish people. Just straight from dictionary.com, okay? 
straight from dictionary.com, it says that a Jew is typically an offensive comment in today's cultural language. A Jew, though, is not really a offensive comment at all. It would like be saying, you're a Dietzvillian, or you're a, a Millbrookian, or whatever it might be. I'm an American. It's not offensive. And so, but unfortunately, we've allowed it to become offensive because of how some people have chosen to use it, right? But a Jew is fundamentally um, a man or woman who is born from a Jewish woman, okay? Flesh of flesh, born from a Jewish woman. Um, the word Jew actually comes from the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob that we all studied together. And this is like, I'm just going, Lord, you're so good. You know, we studied Genesis, we got all this. Uh, you know, here we are with Judah. And so now what we have is that the Jewish nation comes about much later in history than what we're dealing with from this stamp, you know, from the standpoint of where we are in the Bible. We're after Genesis, we're in the New Testament period, and they're no longer Israelites per se. They now have the tribe of Judah has been labeled the Jewish tribe. Does that make sense? They're part of the Israelite people. And so that's today still what we have. And so whenever we look at the word, um, the Jew specifically, so the name does not necessarily mean all the tribes of Israel in the Genesis concept and form that we think of it. The word Jew is historically linked typically to that one tribe, the tribe of Judah. And we will study more in depth later about how that affects it and when we think about the time of Jesus. Now this image that we see here is of a Jewish person that has um, been uh, theatrically dressed up to in the uh, garb of what a Pharisee would have war in the time of Jesus. If you'll notice, he actually has on his breastplate there an ephod, uh, E-P-H-O-D. An ephod was a garment that was worn by the priest in the service of the temple, and the Pharisees wore them as well, and we have that they have a prayer shawl around his head. And I didn't bring mine, but I, have I shown you all the prayer shawl before? I think I did. Um, and I actually have a garment that has an ephod on it. I have a satchel that has an ephod replica on it. But it, you'll notice how many jewels are in the ephod. Twelve. twelve. <laughs> okay, the twelve tribes of Israel. And so this is an image of what Nicodemus would have looked like. I want you to have something in your mind of if this was Nicodemus, this was Nicodemus, okay? That's what we should have in our mind. So historically speaking, we know that the tribe of Judah is one of the twelve tribes, and the name Israel comes from the Old Testament account of when? Jacob wrestled with God. Remember, Jacob wrestled with God at the shore of the river, and God pounded him on the hip, and he messed him up, and when he was limping to Esau, he's like, oh, hey, I'm old, I can't really get around good, I can't go with you, Esau, remember that story? And so, therefore, the 12 sons Jacob had his, by his four wives become these tribes of Israel and eventually occupy the lands that we know as current-day Israel. But current-day Israel if you look at a modern day map, doesn't occupy near the land territory that the 12 tribes occupied. And if you look here at this map, this is the original 12 tribes, what they would have occupied at that time period, okay? At the time of whenever we come out of the promised land, or to the promised land from the Exodus, and now Rome, though, is occupying, so we're several hundred of thousands of years past that time to where we are now, okay? So, um, what we're going to talk about is who is Nicodemus, and we're going to refer to Nicodemus from this point forward as Nico, okay, just so I can shorten the phrase up, Nico, okay, so Nicodemus is Nico. Um, what, did Nic what did it mean that Nicodemus was a Pharisee? When we think about Nicodemus as a Pharisee, he would have been the order of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of many men that sat between three primary groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Essenes we most often associate with the Qumran society or other people like that that at one point even uh, pull themselves away from Jerusalem of Jesus' time. They're like, listen, the scripture is so messed up. We've had all these people come in and Rome is in control. We're just going to isolate ourselves off because remember, John the baptizer is even considered possibly as a member of the Qumran society because of his wild hair and the way he thought and all the things he did, it was very symbolic of how they treated the scripture 
in the desert. You guys okay? Have I lost y'all? You with me still? Okay. So now the Pharisees, what's unique about the Pharisees is, is the Pharisees believe that there is a resurrection. So the body is going to be resurrected at the time of the Messiah, Yeshua, coming back. That is what the Pharisees primarily believed. They also believed in angels. The Sadducees, on the other hand, though, they were legalistic. The Bible has been given to us by God. The Bible, the Torah, has been given to us by God. And we are to follow the Torah in this way. And there is no resurrection of the dead. And once you've done your deeds here, you're over with. And it's done. Sheol. And we're all out. Okay? So it was a very different approach to the view of what the afterlife even symbolized okay so the pharisees were more if we were to associate with a group we would probably lean more toward the pharisees from a resurrection and that kind of but they were very very legalistic because how did you get to heaven as a jew how did you please god you obeyed the law it all was dealt with works how good did i work how good did i obey the law and so the torah was ultimately a book of do's and don'ts as a good observant Jew, you do this. And if you do this, then God is pleased with you. And if God is pleased with you, then you know one day, whenever it's your time, God will permit you into his heaven. And, but if you're not, if you don't, uh, and you say, well, Chad, there's like 600 and something laws in the Torah. Yes, there are. But there's 10 primary, right, that we know from Exodus. The 10 commandments. Thou shalt not have any other God before me. You know, thou shalt... Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt, and all these thou shalt that we know about, okay? Those are side of the embedding that we should have in our minds of the do's and don'ts. And so uh, if we look at what happens next, that the Pharisee was a member of this high Jewish council called the Sanhedrin, and the council was made up of a total of 71 members. The night Jesus was brought before Caiaphas, he was brought before the Sanhedrin. So you know the story of when Jesus is crucified and he's brought from the Garden of Gethsemane? He was brought at night originally to Caiaphas' father. And then after he was brought to Caiaphas' father, um, he was then brought to Caiaphas. Caiaphas then judged him. Um, at that judgment, he was accused of blasphemy. And that, that was then a, a portion of the Sanhedrin present, of these 70 men, were present on the second story of Caiaphas' home. Okay? And so that's what we're looking at here is this Sanhedrin is made up of these Pharisees and Sadducees and the Essenes. Now, what was a Pharisee like in public life? If we can imagine um, a Pharisee walking down an open street in the marketplace, if you've watched the video series called The Chosen, in the second series you actually get a glimpse of what it was like for a Pharisee to walk down the street. And when the Pharisees walked down the street, they would, people would duck and they would just sort of bow their head and let the Pharisee walk by. You know, it, they were given honor. They were given privilege. When the Pharisees walked through the temple, you know, that was, oh, the Pharisees are here, you know, and let me stand over to the side kind of thing. They're the teacher. They're the knowed one. They're the ones that are holy. They are the ones that can pronounce the judgments and all these other kind of things. We don't want to do anything to make the Pharisees mad. And so they were both revered and feared. Does that make sense? I know revering something has fear in it, but I'm talking about fear in a negative sense. They were both revered as holy men, but also feared because of the power that they wielded. Because keep in mind, who controlled what temple period are we in? We are in the second temple period of Herod the Great. And so the temple has been bought by Herod and Rome has now placed their own ruler in charge of the temple. Do you get that? And so if I, if I, yes, that's Caiaphas. So if I am Caiaphas and I'm in cahoots with Rome, I've bought my way into the temp temple. I've been set within the temple. So the temple has really turned into a, not even a good image of what was supposed to be done by Moses at the tabernacle at Mount Sinai. It doesn't even resemble it from that standpoint anymore. All we've got is the Holy of Holies still and the inner courts and all that kind of stuff. But from the standpoint of why it was originally made, we are far from what it should be now. It's become a political machine. Does that make sense? So it's been bought literally by Rome. Rome put Caiaphas in place. Okay? 
Now, Jesus, if we look at who Jesus was, we begin to see a man that was possibly born between 7 B.C. and 6, or probably 3 or 4 B.C., and lived to around 26 to 30 some odd B.C., okay? or A.D., pardon me, A.D. And so what we're dealing with is we have to put in our mind the cultural context of Jesus is this boy that grew up in a little town of Nazareth that had about 500 people in it. It's just off the shore of Galilee by a few miles. And here is Jesus growing up in this little bitty town called Nazareth. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But whenever he was born in Bethlehem, remember what happened is, is that the Herod got word, Herod the Great got word of what was going on. And whenever he got word of what was going on, remember, he had the killing of the innocents. Do you all remember that story where Herod sent the troops in to kill all the newborn babies that were less than three years old, and you say, well, hold on, the time frame, Chad. Well, that's exactly why, because by the killing of the innocents, it gave the three-year period that it would have taken for the Magi to leave and not come back to Herod, and now that was that three-year window, and so Herod didn't know how old the baby would have been by this point, we think it's like one night it happened, the next night the Magi left, the next night Herod showed up, the next night all the babies were killed. No, which years in process here, okay? And so from a timing standpoint, we're now at that point where we begin to think about and see that we have, uh, Jesus has gone as well from Bethlehem, he has gone to Egypt. And in Egypt, his parents stayed to flee the killing of the innocents and then from there what happened is is that we actually see that they go back and they live in Nazareth is where they settle. And so the impregnated Mary is back with the baby that she had. You get my drift? And now Jesus had approximately four brothers and two sisters based on historical accounts that we can find reference to. And so now what you've got is you've got a family with the, one boy, the baby boy who was the baby that was born before they were married. So you get, the, you get the sense of what it maybe was like to be Jesus growing up, right? The one kid that it's like, oh, they had to get married because, you know, Jesus was here. Um, and we don't think about it that way often, do we? Um, we often just think about, oh, it's the beautiful image of Jesus. Why do I need you to stay still, bud? And so what happens is, is that we're dealing now with Mary and Joseph lives, living in Nazareth. And we're dealing with the Holy Spirit being um, the impact that was done to actually Mary to make her pregnant. And then you see, Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great, and Jesus grew up around his cousin. And his cousin would have been who? John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer. And so they would have went on family trips with one another. And you're like, what do you mean? They went camping with one another? Did they have the family reunion up at, you know, Aniana or whatever? Uh, no, what I'm saying is, is that they had the festivals that they went to with one another. And so John the baptizer, and the reason we have to know about John the baptizer is, is that in the second part of John 3, it's all about John the baptizer. So if we don't know who John the baptizer is, the second part of John chapter 3, you're going to be like, I'm lost. So John the baptizer and Jesus would have went to festivals together because their families would have traveled to the Sukkah, the uh, Festival of Booths, or they would have went to the Passover Festival in Jerusalem with one another. They would have been together traveling as young boys at some point. And what, what do we do? We see, we, we see Jesus as a baby, and when I say we see him as a baby, we see him born, and we see where he moves to. We have no images of Jesus as a baby boy, a little baby. In Catholicism, there are some really neat stories about that Jesus was playing with mud, and it turned into a bird, and all this kind of stuff, but we don't have any historical accounts from this standpoint, okay? And so what we're now looking at is we begin to see that Jesus gets to the age of 12, and we intersect with Jesus again all of a sudden. And where do we find Jesus at? In the temple. And what is he doing in the temple? He's teaching, but he's teaching by using this Socratic method. He's asking them questions, and they're amazed. How can a 12-year-old boy that's been in synagogue in Galilee in the town of Nazareth, because remember, it takes 10 men to form a synagogue, a minion, and those 10 men form that synagogue in Nazareth. How is this boy from Galilee, this place that really doesn't have a lot of learned even though Galilee, quite frankly, there is a lot of people that come from Galilee that were very learned, if you look historically back. 
And so what happens is, is Jesus is in the temple now and he's questioning these men that should be the teachers of the law and it's as if he knows it better than they do. And they're kind of freaking out. They're like, and he asked his mom, he said, where did you expect me to be? I was in my father's house. And there's a beautiful, again, if you ever watch the Chosen series, I can't remember which episode it is, but you see Jesus being found by his mother and father in Jerusalem. And he's like, Mom, where did you, why did you get all worried? You knew I was with Dad. You know, and so that's, that's kind of interesting because what do you understand from his 12-year-old interaction? <laughs> that's like really cool. Y'all get that? Most people just skip that real quick, and they're like, oh, well, his mom and dad were worried because they couldn't find him, and he was in the temple, and that's kind of cool. But, ma'am? Not that bad. Not that, not, <laughs> not Joseph. It was not Joseph. And so you see at 12, Jesus realizes, because a lot of people go, well, hold on, Jesus didn't really know who he was till he was right in the water at the Jordan River when he was baptized by his cousin. That's when Jesus became God. That's when Jesus became aware of who he was. The Bible doesn't stand up. You can't, there's no fact to stand up to that argument. We know that Jesus knew who he was at 12 in some sense. Did he have the full knowledge that he had whenever he was baptized? I don't know. I, personally, I don't think so, but I don't know that for a fact. But what we do know is at 12 that he was fully beginning to understand who he was and he was different. And so now, here's this adolescent boy that has grown up in this little village. And so now Jesus moves to his adulthood, and we see Jesus interacting with different people. And we need to think about how he's interacting with these people. On one hand, to the public, Jesus, and I love this, I came, I came up with this on my own, but I kind of snickered when I did it, because Kelly says I laugh at myself a lot. And Jesus must have been a prophet to some. He must have been a healer to others and a grocery store to some. He was like a Roman Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> That's probably not right for a Jewish person, sorry. He was probably a Roman Publix, you know. He, he, had, he was a built-in grocery store, and he was a rabbi, and he, to some, he had even become the Messiah in public, right? We know that from the Scripture accounts, that Jesus was even viewed. To the Pharisees, though, remember the Pharisees were sending people to discover who Jesus was because they had already had people come in and disturb the peace and claim to be the Messiah. But now the Pharisees want to know for sure, are you the Messiah? So they send people to go and inspect Jesus. And to the Pharisees that were sent to inspect Jesus, they're like, he's a prophet. He can heal some people. We've seen him heal people. I can imagine the report coming back to Jerusalem. This Yeshua, this, this Joshua, this Jesus from Galilee, he heals. I saw it. He feeds. He's even a prophet. But I don't know that I believe that he is the Messiah. I can hear somebody telling Nico that, right? Do you see that? To his family, he was crazy. <laughs> Stone cold crazy. You say, no, how do you know that? Because at one point, Jesus is teaching in a household, and his family comes, and they're like, hey, your mom, dad, your sister, not his dad, because we think his dad's dead by now. Your, your mom and your brothers are outside they need you. And he's like, well, you're my brothers and sisters, and you're my family, and Jesus is teaching inside the home. And they're like, Jesus is crazy. we got to go get Jesus. Jesus lost his meds. You know, we need to get Jesus. And so his family even at one point believed Jesus might be crazy. Uh, but later on what we see is that his brother actually declares out loud. His, uh, his brother James actually becomes a devout follower of his after his death and resurrection, becomes part of the Jerusalem council. And then we see John, his cousin, declare in the Jordan River, Behold, the Lamb of God. You know, and he baptizes him there. So his own family, there's, you see this twist? I mean, we so often skip through this kind of stuff, and we get the image, and it's like, wow. Think about what, when Jesus went back to his hometown to preach that first time, and he stood up in the synagogue, and the scroll was given through to him, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and what do they do? And he sits down in their presence, and he said, behold, the scroll of Isaiah is, today, this is true. And everybody's like, drive him out and throw him over the cliff, you know? So people literally think he's nut job. And then to Rome, Jesus was someone who could actually upset the social order. And you say, Chad, how do you know that? Look at John the Baptist. What happened when Herod Antipas, y'all remember we studied Herod, Herod Antipas with one another. Who was he? He was, he was the governor. Who was he kin to? He was the son of, he was the son of Herod the Great. 
So Herod the Great tried to have Jesus killed when he was a baby. Remember? Isn't that cool to think about? He, his, Herod Antipas' dad tried to have Jesus killed when he was a little baby. And why was Jesus not publicly in front of Herod Antipas at his time as an adult? Because John the Baptist had already been imprisoned because of how he had scolded Herod Antipas for what had happened to his wife. Yes, what? I was wondering, since like Herod the Great, he killed all the babies. Yes. So would there have been like a shortage of boys to work in that area? Well, it was just in Bethlehem, remember. He just killed the babies in the Bethlehem area. He didn't go everywhere. So there was not a shortage that we know of. And so now what's happening is, is inside Rome, he is viewed literally as possibly a social dissident. If we think about that, it's like, what's going on with this guy from Galilee? And so in Rome's mind, we got to keep a watch on this too because these Jewish people like to riot a lot. <laughs> I mean, in, in the time of Jesus, it was not uncommon for there to be riots on the Temple Mount or in other parts of the city. And you say, well, how do you know that, Chad? Well, who was in jail that was traded for Jesus? Barabbas. And why was Barabbas in jail? Because he was a zealot rioter. Had led an insurrection. Okay? So they, they, Rome does not want this to get out. Now, we're going to watch a video. We're going to watch a few videos tonight. So we're going to watch the first one. Calvin, okay, we need to go full screen on this. If you read the New Testament, you'll notice that the most common title people use to describe Jesus is the Christ. That is the Messiah. But surprisingly, Jesus almost never used that word to describe himself. Instead, he called himself the Son of Man. word to this himself said he called himself the son of man the son of man what does that mean well the phrase comes from an important chapter in the book of daniel in the old testament daniel was an israelite prisoner of war who was forced to live in the empire of babylon and work for the prideful violent king who destroyed his home that sounds horrible and while he was living and working in Babylon, Daniel had this crazy prophetic dream. You ready for it? I'm ready. He saw four beasts crawling out of a dark sea, hybrid monster-like animals, each scarier than the one before. And the fourth beast is so mutant, there's nothing to compare it to. And it's violent, leaving death and destruction in its wake. What in the world? If you read the New Testament, you'll notice that the most common title people use to describe Jesus is the Christ, that is, the Messiah. But surprisingly, Jesus almost never used that word to describe himself. Instead, he called himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man, what does that mean? Well, the phrase comes from an important chapter in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was an Israelite prisoner of war who was forced to live in the empire of Babylon and work for the prideful, violent king who destroyed his home. That sounds horrible. And while he was living and working in Babylon, Daniel had this crazy prophetic dream. You ready for it? I'm ready. He saw four beasts crawling out of a dark sea, hybrid monster-like animals, each scarier than the one before. And the fourth beast is so mutant, there's nothing to compare it to. And it's violent, leaving death and destruction in its wake. What in the world is this about? Well, he's told that these beasts symbolize violent, prideful kings and their empires. Oh, like the one Daniel's enslaved to. Yeah, and these creatures might seem random to you, but these images are developing an important biblical theme. How humans are these remarkable creatures capable of doing great good and horrible evil. How we can behave like animals. Right. Look at the first pages of the Bible. God creates the beasts of the field and humans together, all from the dust. But then the humans are set apart and given a royal task of being God's image. So humans are like the animals, but called to become much more. Yeah, they're to be God's representatives on earth, ruling on his behalf, like kings and queens. 
But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast who says that they could be more than just God's partners. Yeah, that they could rule the world on their own terms, which sounds good to them. But God knows this will be a disaster. And so he expels the humans to the realm of the beasts. The partnership is lost. But God makes a promise that one day a human will be born who won't give in to the beast. Rather, he'll overcome and strike the beast while being struck by it. Okay, so for the rest of the biblical story, we're waiting for that human. But instead, in story after story, we find people acting like beasts. Yeah, like in the next story about Cain. He was jealous and angry at his brother Abel. God warns Cain that he's facing a beastly urge called sin, a dark, mysterious kind of evil that consumes humans. But God says that Cain can rule the beast if he chooses. But he doesn't rule the beast. He lets this urge devour him, and he becomes a beast. And then after this, Cain's children spread their animal-like violence, and it leads to the founding of a whole civilization known for its beastly pride, the city of Babylon. Okay, Babylon. So fast forward, this is where Daniel is enslaved, having this bizarro dream. Exactly. Now, watch what happens next in Daniel's dream. He sees into God's throne room where a court is set up, and God condemns the beast to destruction. That's great. And then Daniel sees that there's actually more than one divine throne. Oh, right, the throne that humanity left behind. Right. There hasn't been a human who's able to overcome the beast and rule alongside God until now. Daniel sees a figure called the Son of Man, which means a human. And he rides on a cloud up into God's presence and then sits down on the divine throne to rule the world. The partnership's renewed. Yes, and even more, all humanity worships and serves this Son of Man alongside God. Oh, worship? So this is no ordinary human. This is like a God human. Exactly. And so now you can see why Jesus of Nazareth, when he came onto the scene centuries later, chose this title, the Son of Man, for himself. He was claiming to be that truly human one on a mission to confront the beast. He was tempted to seize power on the beast's terms. But unlike every human before him, Jesus resisted the urge. And then he went about banishing the beast from people's lives, and he was teaching people how to rule the beast instead of being ruled by it. Okay, so how do you rule the beast? Well, Jesus did it by giving up his life. Wait, rule the beast by dying? Yes. When Jesus was on trial in a human courtroom and being condemned to death, he said, From this moment on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at God's right hand and coming on the clouds. But this is the moment he's about to die. Exactly. From one perspective, the cross looks like a beastly torture device, but Jesus viewed it as his throne. And on this throne, he exposed the subhuman nature of our evil by letting it do its worst, and then he overcame it with his divine life and love. Jesus' execution was his exaltation. So Jesus is the first human to overcome the beast, and as a result, he can partner with God to rule the world. And so now, Jesus is summoning a new humanity into existence, one that can overcome the beast in the same paradoxical way. To rule the beast by dying. And then by discovering that Jesus' life and power can become our life and power. So we can rule the world as God's partners, but Jesus style, in the power of service, humility, and self-giving love. The Son of Man. Who, who is the Son of Man? Jesus is. Echoes back. Um, so where does the image of the Son of Man come from? From the book of Daniel. Okay? That imagery is going to follow Jesus through his entire ministry after John the Baptist. Okay? He's going to assume that identity throughout the rest of his adult ministry. Now, um, we're going to go ahead and start on this tonight because we're, gonna, we're not going to get as far as I thought we would. So, um, overprepared, which is not a bad thing. Uh, so, uh, if you, Wes, would you grab a pencil and start pass, take one down and pass it around? 99 pencils on the wall. Um, 
All right, and so what we're going to do is we're going to actually go through John chapter 3 with one another, and we are going to begin to work on it. You guys okay? You guys, uh, you guys okay? All right, so we got pencils coming, okay? We got pencils coming. So Calvin, I'm going to rotate, and I'm going to, um, or no, I'm going to stay this way. And I'm going to use my pencil, and I'm going to interact with y'all as if we were using the pencil here. And so let's go to John. John 3. Ah, it saved my text. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. The very first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through John chapter 3, the front side. And what I want you to do is I want you to mark with the letter J, Everywhere that you see Jesus, see right there, in verse 2, this man came to Jesus. I want you to mark everywhere where you see Nicodemus with an N, Nico above the man, and then J above where we see Jesus. God gets a triangle, okay? You see down here in the third line, God has a triangle. And I want you to go down through it, and I want us to work through it right now, literally together, okay? So here we go. We're going to read it together. Now there was a man, Nico, N above man of the Pharisees, whose name was Nicodemus, in above Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man, Nico, came to Jesus at night, a J, you see that? At night and said to Jesus, Rabbi, a J above Rabbi. Y'all following what we're doing? Y'all got the drift of it? We know that you are a teacher, oh, that you, there should have been a J above the you, you see that? You are a teacher who has come from God, triangle. For no one is able to perform these signs that you, a J, are performing unless God were with him. Y'all got it? Okay. Y'all following? Come on, give it to me. Some nods or something. Okay. Verse 3. Okay. Verse 3. Jesus, J, answered and said to who? Nico, in, truly, truly, I, Jesus, say to Nico, unless someone is born from above, he, that is not Nico, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to J, how can a man be born when he is an old man? He is not able to enter his mother's womb for the second time and be born, can he? Jesus, J, answered, Truly, truly, I, Jesus, say to you, Nico, unless someone is born of water and spirit, he, that is not Nico, is not able to enter into the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit, look how I have spirit. See what I did with spirit? Just draw you a little cloud around it. Okay? Only the capital spirit. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I, Jesus, said to you, Nico, it is necessary for you, Nico, to be born from above okay let's keep going the wind verse 8 the wind blows wherever it wishes and you Nico hear the sound of it but you Nico do not know where it comes from and where it is going so everyone who is born of the spirit make you a cloud Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus how can these things be? Okay, flip to the back. Jesus answered and said to Nico. Okay. Are you, Nico, the teacher of Israel? And you, Nico, you do not understand these things. 
Remember, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I, Jesus, say to you, Nico, we speak what we know and we testify about what we have seen and you, Nico, do not accept our testimony. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. If I, Jesus, tell you, Nico, earthly things, and you, Nico, do not believe, how will you, Nico, believe if I, Jesus, tell you, Nico, heavenly things? We're almost done. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll look at that and verify. I don't. Verse 13. And no one ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven. Who? Jesus. There we go. Jesus, who is who? Son the man. Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, thus it is necessary that the Jesus be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life for in this way God triangle loved the world so that God triangle gave his triangle one and only son Jesus in order that everyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but will have eternal life. Okay, almost there. For God, triangle, did not send his Jesus into the world in order that Jesus would judge, should judge the world, but in order that the world should be saved through Jesus, the one who believes in Jesus is not judged. That's an awesome sermon right there. That one, those five, those five words. Um, but the one who does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Jesus J of Triangle. You see that? And this is the judgment, that the light, that's the key. Who said that? The light, that is Jesus. Let me ask you something real quick. Chad, how do you know the light is Jesus? Go back to our first Bible study with one another. What happened on creation? Who lit? What happened first before the sun? There was light. Oh man, that makes the short. Oh, that gets you right there. Ooh, man, yeah, that's good. that's worth the price all night right there. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the Jesus because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices evil hates the Jesus and does not come to Jesus, lest his deeds were exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to Jesus, in order that his deeds may be revealed that they are done in God. Oh, man, that is some good preaching right there. Whew. Golly. All right. Now, I need you to keep these, okay? I need you to keep these till next week. Um, by the way, I have done this for the last four weeks on this verse, and we have not even begun to fight, okay? We're going to be looking for the word born next. We're going to draw a little, um, if you go up, and this is something y'all can work on this week. If you go back here and look, and it says, see right here where it says born? What I've been doing is I draw a little bitty baby's head with two strands of hair. <laughs> Everywhere above where it says born, it gets a little baby head, okay? Everywhere that's born gets a little baby head. So we need to do that? You need to draw a baby's head above everybody that says born. All right? 
Okay? Y'all got me? Just, I promise you, I promise you, maybe it's going to be five weeks till we get this done because I thought we were going to get further tonight. It is, you are going to look back at this sheet of paper that's in your hand and you're going to be like, I will study my Bible this way from here forward. I will not read another verse without doing this from this point forward because I did not realize. Because let me ask you this, just by looking at what you're looking at, go to the very front page and look at the first paragraph of the first sections. Who's talking to who? What does it look like as you travel down the page? Who's talking to who? God steps in, and we start to see God inside the imagery of it. Um, this is the other thing I want you to do. Every place you see the word wind. No, it's actually different. Um, see the word wind in, in verse 8? That whole section, I've separated it off for you in a separate paragraph. What I want you to do in wind, if you look up at the screen, is I want you to draw three little lines like that. The wind blows wherever it, there's the wind again, it. You hear the, Calvin, Calvin, need you to push my screen back up, bud. Running out of time, thank you. So let's go full screen this, okay? So everywhere you see, the wind, see it, three lines, okay? Look, there's a born, right? Little, okay, wind, okay? Every place you see wind, I want you to draw the wind, okay? Born and wind. Born is baby head, wind is three lines. No, ma'am. The, the, the printouts I made for the people on YouTube so that they can find them. Oh, okay. There's two up there in the first page. Yes, there is. And it's going to be a word hunt. Y'all are going to be on a word hunt, okay? We, by the time you get through this paper, you're going to be amazed. We didn't get anywhere tonight that I wanted to go. We are out of time, and I could, I, we could stay here for another three days. Um, uh, ma'am? I know, I know. I'm just, it's one of those studies where you start, and so let's go down here and we'll finish tonight. Um, what we've got now is that we've got the Son of Man. We've identified Jesus. And what we're going to do is next week, we're going to talk about who God is, okay? So we've talked tonight and we've identified who Jesus is. Do you have a firm plant in your head of why Jesus is called the Son of Man? He came from Daniel 7 as the Son of Man. You understand who he is, where he grew up, and what it was been like sort of for Jesus to be there. Next week, we're going to look into the imagery of God. And we're going to look into the imagery of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to go through some Bible videos, and we're going to do those. And then we're going to start asking questions of the text that you have. If you forget yours next week, don't freak out. You're just going to have to go back through and fill out NJ and triangle and all that stuff again. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay you got to give me some feedback. This was completely like out of the blue. I've never talked to this level in this big of a group setting. I've done it in a very small, like private, but not in this big. I appreciate the slow down comment. I'll try to slow down and not rush. There's just so much I'm trying to get through, so I'll slow down so it's effective. What else would you say? Effective, did you get away from something tonight you thought that was valuable, Chad, or was all of it a waste? I need candid feedback. Yes. Yes, you are. Kelly asked earlier too about the, who's the we? Who's the we? We're going to go through every bit of that, and that be part of that that you go, oh my gosh, you know, oh wow, um, just a glimpse. Who was with Jesus at creation? Yeah. Yeah, we think it is around 27 is what we would think. The typical age range, they would process it somewhere between the age of 26 and 30. Uh, we think around 27-ish because there's a debate on the year and the way the calendars line up and 
some of the stuff. So Jesus either died in AD 30 or AD 33, so that modifies birth and dates and all that, but it's somewhere between 27 and 33. Other question or comments? I really would like some feedback. How was tonight from a learner standpoint? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if you just sit there and read it, and then you leave, well, who's the it? Who's it? Is it? Yeah. Who, who, who? Yes. I feel like even putting the serial letters on there makes it easier to understand because you do get lost when it says, keep their opinion on them. Yes. Yes. So just putting the, yes. the letters on there helps keep them in that one frame of thought. Yeah, we have a picture. Yes. Uh, we have, in this. In this text, we are about to go through about 20-something plus scriptures are connected to John chapter 3. We are literally going to go from Numbers to Isaiah to other parts of John to other parts of Luke. We're going to fast forward to Revelation. I mean, there is so much scripture that is packed into John chapter 3, and I'm going to connect it. I'm going to show you where it's all connected. And whenever it connects... That is when the light bulb is going to go off and you're going to freak out. You're going to be like, no way, that is what he was telling him. Because we read it and we don't understand the depth of what he was telling Nicodemus. What he told Nicodemus that night, I'm going to leave you with this. This is a nugget from, this is like a fast forward, okay? This is back to the future. Y'all are going to get something ahead of time, okay? Nicodemus Think about it for just a second. Jesus told Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is processing every word Jesus says. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, the Son of Man must be lifted up on a pole. My question to you is, did Nicodemus know about the crucifixion at this moment of John 3 tonight? Had no idea. Think about what must have happened in Nicodemus's mind whenever he saw Jesus lifted on a pole and where he went back to in his mind. Do you see? Oh, man, that's good. Cool. Yes. And we're going to break that down to like finite detail. So I, this, is, this is crazy junk, okay? I, I, yes. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Tonight, I need a... Hey, y'all with me? We're good? Okay. All right. Let's pray. Um, any prayer requests tonight? Calvin, you can turn off live. Yeah. Tina, thank you.